uh, we actively work on on the global polio eradication, both at uh, the surveillance or for the disease and also at uh, quality control of vaccines or even uh, developing new vaccines for to finish the, the job. So a, a very brief introduction on polyvirus uh, infects humans by the oral fecal route, uh, causes polyomyelitis, paralytic polyomyelitis. Uh, I think everybody is familiar with the disease, which causes severe paralysis, uh, in most cases, in many cases permanent. It's part of the epicornavirus family. Uh, I, I could say hydral symmetry is a non-enveloped virus. Uh, has positive stand RNA genome of approximately 7,500 nucleotides. The genome structure is shown here with a capsid region and a non-structural uh, protein region. And there are three serotypes named one, two, and three. So uh, a bit on the uh, status of the Global Polar Eradication Initiative. In fact, most people think that this has kind of finished, but uh, the job has not been finished. Uh, it was quite successful during the initial phases. Uh, there was a huge, uh, quick reduction in, in cases, but uh, the, the program has stalled and for some, uh, because of uh, difficulty of immunizing some regions of the world, uh, we have a, a small but constant number of cases in the last several years. Uh, there is an active surveillance for polyvirus uh, or acute flaxseed paralysis cases. So two samples are taken from paralytic cases and their contacts. There is environmental surveillance which plays a, a significant role in surveillance uh, by looking at wastewater samples. And there is a global polyvirus laboratory network of uh, about 140 labs distributed across the world in which uh, all of us use in WHO validated methods uh, to classify the viruses as wild or vaccine. This is very important because uh, obviously you want to track the where the disease is and uh, to 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 target your vaccination campaign. So establish temporal and geographical links between isolates is very important and to distinguish uh, those uh, from vaccine obviously from 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 non vaccine ones. Uh, so uh, obviously the the success uh, has was mainly due to the uh, efficient vaccine campaigns. They used to we used to immunize uh, kids uh, from the same country and even the same region of the world on the same on a single day. So millions and millions of kids immunized on on the same day, called a national immunization days. Uh, there are two vaccines: one live attenuated vaccine and inactivated vaccines, but uh, the probably still not ideal, so new vaccines might still be needed to finish the. <coughs> the, uh, the, the in, in terms of the progress on JP on the global polio eradication, as I say, it was very successful during the, the initial phases. 99.9% uh, .9 of cases uh, were uh, reduced, uh, but the still circulation of wild type polyvirus one in Pakistan and Afghanistan, an extensive circulation of vaccine derived viruses in Africa, Pakistan uh, and Afghanistan. Uh, in fact, uh, this is a problem. The vaccine is not stable, so uh, if given in areas of low immunity, it can evolve, it can revert to wild type properties and, and be behave like a virus. So in fact, uh, unfortunately, most of the cases in the last few years have been due to the vaccine. So new vaccines have been developed. In fact, NIV has developed uh, with uh, some collaborators, a new vaccine that is now being to try to stop these uh, VDPV2 outbreaks. The, the, the good news is that two of the three serotypes have been eliminated. So uh, the last case due to a wild type PV2 was found in India in 1999, and the last PV3 in 2012 in Nigeria. Only wild type uh, one remains circulating. Environmental surveillance has been critical in, in, in the surveillance for the virus and supporting the eradication campaigns. And you can see here uh, how well, uh, I, I mean, positive results in, 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 sample, in environmental samples correlate with those from paralytic cases. This is an example from Pakistan. It also has allowed it, it, to track the, the, the 
after uh, vaccine campaigns to, to track how long the virus remains in the population, but also actually to find a wild polyvirus uh, circulating in areas where there is no paralytic disease. This is because uh, in some areas where vaccination rates are relatively good, uh, the virus can circulate silently without causing paralytic disease. So environmental surveillance in this case becomes the only way to detect uh, circulation of virus. And an example of that uh, that occurred in Israel in 2003, 13, sorry, where uh, many samples across the countries, and as you can see on the map on the right, were positive for a uh, wild polyvirus. There were not paralytic cases detect detected, and this virus was uh, linked to virus from Pakistan. Uh, a, a, quick, a quick, quick response, vaccination response, stopped the outbreak, uh, which eventually would have paralyzed people because, of course, uh, after uh, circulating for some time, uh, the virus is bound to, to, to reach somebody who is susceptible to the disease. Uh, in fact, environmental surveillance has been used for, for, uh, for a long time. This is a, a paper cut, a newspaper from maybe more than 50 years ago, in which they say that uh, trap file flies test sewage seek sources of polio. It, it is obvious that flies were not useful for this, but uh, sewage is. And uh, it is, uh, in fact, now probably the main uh, uh, surveillance activity in many countries where polyvirus is, is not circulating. So all countries uh, it should conduct this activity in, in order to uh, prove that the country is polio free. Of, of viral circulation. So as, as uh, people are familiar uh, uh, in this group, uh, uh, samples are collected uh, used in different ways, uh, grab method, 24 hour composite samples, and then concentrated again using different procedures. And in the case of poliovirus, we use a virus isolation system uh, still. So uh, cell cultures are used to detect uh, samples positive for, for, for poliovirus, which are then sequenced uh, uh, and analyze. So, uh, as mentioned, sequencing for us is very important. We, 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 it is not enough just to determine that the virus is positive for the virus. We need to know the sequence to know what virus it is. So, we've been doing this for for many years now. This is the results of of, of uh, recent years. We have uh, isolated a uh, polyvirus in about uh, five ten percent of the samples, all uh, saving like so related to vaccine use. And probably uh, from people who travel from countries where uh, live attenuated uh, poly vaccine is still used. The UK exclusively used inactivated vaccine from, from some years now. So we sample two sites monthly now, uh, twice a month in London, uh, two sites in Glasgow, one site in London, uh, covering different amount of people. And this is the, the, the virus isolations we found. We found uh, uh, one, for example, in 2021, another in 2020. Uh, we test, uh, so uh, the, our system allows to detect uh, other enteroviruses, and this is a, a table in which samples uh, with a color it means we, we have tested them. Red is uh, enterovirus bound, uh, found, so uh, samples in which uh, is normally uh, uh, in the UK and in many other countries, if surveillance is done properly, you actually uh, enterovirus is, is, is there in 100% of the samples. But uh, I wanted just to show this how the COVID-19 pandemic affected the, uh, the, uh, the transmission of, of enteroviruses as well, because we were not able to detect enterovirus in a number of samples during 2020, late 2020 and early 2021, po possibly due to the uh, measures to stop COVID-19 transmission. This, this has happened in other countries as well and for other respiratory viruses like flu. So uh, as mentioned, we, we depended we, on, on the use of, of cell cultures to detect uh, polyvirus uh, virus isolation in cell cultures and that uh, actually it, it's very time consuming and also uh, not many samples can be tested at the same time. So we, we of course, uh, are always uh, interested in developing direct detection methods for uh, for polyvirus and other enteroviruses. And we, we have been, again, working uh, for this for uh, a number of years, and we have now quite good uh, uh, methods that combine the, uh, PCR, direct detection PCR, with uh, next generation sequence analysis, either using 
Illumina or a, a nano or Oxford nanopore technology. So that allows to uh, sequence mixtures and, and distinguish different viruses uh, from each other. Uh, to just show how powerful this method is, this is just shows the results from two samples, uh, one from London, one from uh, Pakistan. This is a single aliquot corresponding to 15 milliliters of raw sewage. And you can see the number of different enterovirus serotypes uh, what we can detect in, in this single aliquot. Uh, human enteroviruses uh, are divided in, in four species, A, B, C, and D, and there are about 110 different serotypes uh, that have been described. So you can see in a single sample from, in a single aliquot of a single sample from Pakistan, we can detect 60 different serotypes. So that's very powerful technique. Um, because in the past, you know, we depended on 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 the short PCR uh, assay that uh, obviously Sanger sequencing would would only sequence the most prevalent virus in, in that mixture. Uh, enteroviruses, apart from polio, there are some that uh, have implications for hu uh, human health, and this is a, a acute flux in myelitis, a similar syndrome that, that caused by polio. Uh, a high proportion of patients uh, describe preceding virus symptoms one to two weeks before weakness onset. Symptoms include fever, rhea, cough, vomiting, or diarrhea. Uh, the onset of weakness is rapid within hours to a few days. Weakness is in one or more limbs and may be accompanied by sick neck, headache, or pain in the affected limbs. And predominantly, gray matter is affected. In fact, uh, in, more, in, in, in many cases, the the paralysis is permanent uh, and this is uh, most likely associated with another enterovirus with enterovirus D68. So from uh, 2010 large increases in increases in the incidence of uh, severe respiratory illness associated with this virus uh, began to be reported worldwide. The virus was first described in 62 but only uh, after 2010, the, it seems to uh, have been clearly associated with some of uh, severe disease. In fact, in, in 2014, the USA experienced a nationwide outbreak of uh, EVD68 associated severe uh, respiratory illness and 120 AFM cases, AFM cases. The outbreaks of AFM have occurred every two years in the USA and in Europe. Uh, again, also 4 and 29 AFP, AFM cases uh, with associated uh, EVD68 infection were reported in 2014 and 2016, respectively. In the UK, also a substantial increase of AFM cases annually occurred uh, in, in 2000. And so from, from less than five normally occurring annually to 40 that were described in 2018. And this was reported in association with an, with an upsurge of the EVD68 detections, with similar increases in DC68 detection in other European countries. So there are some evidence of, of uh, a link between uh, this paralysis uh, and, and, and EVD68 and other viruses like A71 in the USA and, and the UK. This is becoming more and more clear that there is a clear association. And uh, this is, for example, in, in from the USA. So you can see that in green is a, a periods of uh, EVD68 circulation, and the columns indicate uh, peaks on on AFM cases. So you can see a clear two-year cycle in, in the case of the Asia, which which is uh, somehow uh, similar in Europe as well. And this is uh, the the cases in the UK, 40 AFM cases. And, and you can see how well it correlates with uh, D68 associations, uh, solid detections. So we, what we did is we, we looked back at all our uh, samples that uh, were stored for uh, these periods. And we, in fact, we, we had samples from, from um, Glasgow, in the circles, and the, uh, from London, the rhomboids. And, and the green one indicates uh, in this in the case uh, the positive samples for D68, which they match quite nicely with periods of high clinical prevalence of this virus. So 
we, we, we can say that we can actually use this as a as a alert system or, or as an indication of, of, of the circulation of D68. Uh, in fact, uh, as you saw, the, the period, uh, the periods of, of the detection actually predicted that there was a large peak again in 2020, but this, this didn't happen. And this is probably because of, again, as I mentioned before, the COVID-19 pandemic, although, of course, there was less surveillance as well. But uh, so the, the virus has come back with a vengeance uh, in, in 2021. And there are a large numbers of cases being described. This is only uh, include a few of them. Uh, October is high and November again, very high, um, particularly for I think I believe there is a large outbreak in, in Wales uh, happening at the moment. So again, we looked at our, our samples for uh, D68 and we actually found uh, a lot of virus. Uh, you can see the in this case, red indicates presence of D68, green absence. You can see uh, that we saw quite a lot in 2018. And again, in this year, 2021, there was a lot of, of, of D68 present in, in the in wastewater samples. At the top, you can see a, a, a phylogenetic tree. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this, this just relates the sequence from different viruses. So the closer they are in the tree, the closer genetic uh, properties between them. Uh, so, so we actually found viruses related to uh, those circulating in, in previous years in Europe and the USA, or belonging to three different genetic clusters, two from uh, clade B3 and uh, another from uh, clade D, which is a common uh, event in previous years. So normally the viruses from two different genetic clades have uh, co-circulated uh, since 2018. We've done that for other enteroviruses. Uh, I'm not going to go through that, but Kotsaki A6, we find also a good representation of, of uh, different uh, genotypes in sewage, same of Ecovirus 30. But then came uh, uh, COVID. So COVID-19 came in, in at the beginning of 2020. And of course, uh, it became quite obvious quite early in, during the pandemic that the virus can, could be detected in, in wastewater samples. So we, we again design quite quickly uh, some methods for this detection based on our experience and the fact that we had samples available for this purpose. And uh, so we, we basically, yeah, just to summarize the, the, the method, we, we take uh, one liter samples, composite samples from Beckton, mainly uh, in London, and we concentrate using uh, centrifugation devices is, is quite a simple procedure and, and uh, you can concentrate 70 ml to uh, milliliters to 400 microliters. Then extract the RNA and uh, we conduct uh, a number of replicate PCRs from each uh, sample date, targeting different uh, regions in the spike gene or other genes of SARS-CoV-2. And then analyze the results by both uh, uh, Sanger and next generation sequence analysis. What we've done uh, lately, so to, to distinguish the, the, the variants of concern that uh, have been described in, in, in England and the world, is to target two uh, PCRs in the spike gene that cover a lot of changes between the, these variants. So uh, by doing this uh, and sequencing this, we can clearly identify what variant and the proportion of variants in, in a particular sample because we use next generation sequencing that allows you to count the mutations, the proportion of nucleotide at, at each critical position. So we uh, detect the, the virus early in the pandemic. In fact, before any cases uh, had been described in the area of surveillance and uh, the detections actually match the, those from the clinical um, samples quite nicely. We, you can see a, a big drop in July, August, and then back again, and it's been very high ever since. And with this uh, technique of sequencing uh, amplicons, uh, targeting different mutations, we actually detected the, the increase in, in D614 variant that uh, happened very early in the pandemic and substituted the original Wuhan virus and became the uh, predominant virus worldwide everywhere. So uh, you can see here a comparison, the different mutations that are characteristic of, of this variant 
that uh, they clearly increase with time and how well that uh, correlated with data from uh, between switch and clinical. We then actually detected the, the rise of the alpha variant, again, showing a good correlation of uh, different mutations with results from um, clinical between uh, wastewater and clinical surveillance. And you can see the, the location of these mutations in the 3D structure of the spike protein bound to the receptor in green. So the, the, as mentioned, there's been a quite a good, uh, a nice correlation between our results and those uh, from clinical uh, data. In fact, we are so thankful to uh, all this data being publicly available, but it has been extremely useful to have uh, data to compare both from GSAID and COC UK. So this is uh, how Alpha and Delta came to dominate. And you can see on the right, very similar uh, what we can see in, in sewage. And in fact, uh, a, a more later variant, uh, sub variant of Delta called a, AY 4.2. Again, on the, on the uh, right hand side, you can see such a good correlation between uh, our data and those uh, from clinical data. Uh, this is particularly in London. So, but then, Came Omicron and everything starts again. <laughs> so I guess we will be busy in the next several weeks. And this is just uh, thank you to, uh, for everybody involved in, in this work. Uh, Tom mainly has been driving this project uh, at NIPS and we have an excellent NGS team uh, in conducting sequencing. And thanks to Colin who helped us uh, procuring the samples and of course Thames Water providing them. And, and there was some funding from NIH uh, HR policy research program. And thank you for very much, all of you, for listening to this. <clears throat> thank you very much. Sorry, I... <clears throat> uh, yeah, first, just uh, um, please uh, type your any questions uh, or just uh, directly post your question. So uh, it's a very interesting talk from me. I have got a couple of questions. Firstly, uh, we obviously currently we are facing these Omicron challenges, and we we been um, suffering the, the the Delta variant. So now, in terms of your technology for the, for example, sequencing, would you be possible to identify the um, ratio or portion of this new variant, for example, in the West or samples, by yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Because, uh, in fact, this is very easy uh, due to the large number of mutations and, and that it has in the critical uh, PCR in, in the critical regions we analyze. So yeah. it will be very easy to do, and we are doing. We will do be doing that as soon as possible. Okay. And in fact, we can. We are adapting this to the nanopore, the Orpho nanopore device, which will allow us to do that much quicker. Right. So, so in, assuming that we have uh, collected the wastewater samples, for example, currently from ASL wastewater treatment plants, you can manage to identify firstly uh, SARS-CoV-2 presence. I think that's no problem. Secondly, what's the ratio from the alpha, beta, delta, omicron? So all of these ratios from the wastewater. So uh, we, we can do that within your sequencing or not for your other technology. Yeah. Yes, as I showed, as I showed the the, the, the two fragments cover a, a sufficient amount of mutations to to you know quite safely say that belong to one or the other variant. So this would be quite st straightforward to do. Um, okay. Yes. So uh, the, the, yeah, the, the Oxford nanopore. Um, it would be as as soon as you have the right reference database it will be possible to do this but we will try and so far we've only used Illumina but okay. we are now working on, on on the nanopore because of course it's, it's much easier to use and faster yeah yeah so assuming that we can do uh, and we're very confident to um, do this kind of the analysis then the next question is if we can correlate this data within the local population so then that can be really a good uh, way to indicate 
in this um, community, for example, within the catchment of the tri wastewater treatment plants, we will be able to evaluate how many people may be affected within different uh, volumes. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, it, it, that's very interesting because, I mean, in the, in the UK, obviously, the clinical surveillance is so efficient that this will help, but obviously, still the clinical surveillance seems to be faster. Uh, but of course, in many, many places around the world, this would be very useful because you will be able to, to just look at your environmental samples and know a lot about what's happening in that population. And this uh, definitely will help knowing if, if there is a time in which we need different vaccines with different strains. So selecting vaccines for uh, different areas would be, uh, this could be very useful because this actually reflects all circulation of all viruses, not only from those who feel ill and need uh, and, and are tested. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think the, now the question is going to how do we identify the exact uh, the population? And actually, we, we, we in, in my lab, we are also working on this, but we focusing on the RT-QPCR method to try to quantify this portion between yeah. each variant. And I think the next question, so we try to using a, you know, easy access way uh, and a fast turnaround. Although I, I fully understand uh, the sequencing probably is the gold standard method to identify this variant. And also the next question is we're trying to you know, improve this um, correlation between the population. So now we, it's, a, it's an estimation and then we are interested to understand what is the resolution of this method in terms of where water surveillance can provide us. And there is obviously a sensitivity challenging. Uh, for yes. all those virus strains, because um, yeah, but, but this is very very interesting. So as a complementary method, okay. So I got a second question using this privilege. So in terms of your data from uh, ED sixty eight, yes. you have some historical surveillance across the UK and Europe. So uh, you that you uh, the data shows that you got presence uh, an on presence. Do you have some quantitative data within the wastewater surveillance uh, in terms of the uh, polio the ED68, particularly maybe? Or yeah, uh, we don't have, uh, we don't do a lot of qPCR because, to be honest, in our hands, is is not as as uh, as efficient, as sensitive, and reproducible as 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 it is the the nested PCR we conduct. We have what you can call semi-quantitative because uh, it would do 10 uh, replicate samples from a single uh, uh, sewage uh, wastewater sample where you know at the beginning of the outbreak normally only one or two are positive and then everything becomes positive all the, all the replicates from the same date but you know that's it is possible to uh, uh, you know the, the clinical laboratories use qPCR systems for this yeah. year, so I'm, I'm sure it's possible to do something on, the, on that front. Yeah, so now the question is, uh, if we still reserve that wastewater samples from the, uh, from the treatment plan you collected from like uh, in Glasgow, in London or in Europe, so maybe do you reserve the DNA sample, uh, the extract the uh, uh, virus samples, or you still reserve the wastewater sample? Uh, 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 I, I'm not sure if I understand. We we only test wastewater, but uh, samples, clinical samples, are tested. Respiratory samples, again, molecularly. Uh, in the, in the case of D68, okay, uh, okay. Vir virus isolation is not efficient. Yeah, I, I see. I mean, clinical sample, I think uh, we can store for a long time. Now, it comes to another challenge. You know, if we analyze the wastewater sample, there is some challenge in terms of the stability of this virus in wastewater. So that needs. Um, ah, yeah, 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 that's yeah. A, yeah. That's a very good point. But yeah, um, we have we have devised so developed a very broad. Uh, and sensitive method for detecting enteroviruses. So with a single PCR, all serotypes can be detected. So what, what you can do is just uh, store this PCR product. And then 
from that PCR product, you can do a nested PCR with any entero you want after okay. that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Uh, that's very, very interesting. So we can also come up some questions from the audience. Um, so very, definitely it's an impressive work. So one of the first questions, have you detected any animal reservoir with their own speci specific COVID variants? Is that common detectable with other disease? Just wondering how prevalent this is in other species. What, what, any, for, for what? Ah. For animal reservoir within their no, own well, species, no, specific I, COVID variants. Uh, I, that, that, that's that's uh, I'm not uh, an expert on that. I, I, I understand that people uh, are saying that uh, these viruses, uh, even even uh, uh, variants, might be generated in animals. But I don't think, I, I, and, and there is definitely uh, evidence of transmission from uh, animals to humans and from humans to animals. But I, I, you know, that's not my field, so I, I, I haven't done much about that. Uh, in terms of the other ones, I think most of the enterovirus are, are uh, hu from humans, but we've actually have sequenced some animals from chimpanzees that are uh, seem to be related hu to human enterovirus. So there is some there is some connection of some serotypes between uh, non non human primates and, and humans yes enterovirus serotypes some of them yeah i think this is an interesting topic so because this goes back to the questions where is really this virus from uh, for example this sars cov 2 there is a lot lots of study to show and uh, the evidence is still i think uh, currently is still uh, open questions or there is some statement from who i think is from the, um, but this is interesting, especially for a virologist uh, in terms of this uh, transmission between the uh, zoonic and the human pathogens. Okay, um, especially they are coming up some mutations. Um, thanks very much. Uh, the next question is from uh, John. Uh, thanks for the ex excellent talk. Do you want to pose this question directly, John? Or I Yes, I can. Uh, just um, can you hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, it was really just uh, wondering, um, uh, trying to understand a bit more about the Omicron variant and uh, how it's come about and uh, why it seems to be more rapidly transmitted and potentially more virulent than the Delta. And why did it outcompete the Delta variant? Can we understand that in t from the molecular structure? Uh, I, if, yes, in fact, uh, there is no evidence of any of this and the, uh, uh, people are saying this mainly because of the molecular structure of the Omicron. So there are, there, it has so many changes that, that this is what has prompted scientists. I mean, this is, has been a bomb for scientists because we have seen variants, we have seen changes, but this is crazy. Yeah, <laughs> and this is a bit shocking. So that's why everybody was a bit afraid. Uh, there are still, you know, as you know, there are all still some going and very few uh, available, but they, that show that response from uh, both infected and immunized people uh, is much less efficient against this, this variant, like 40 times less antibodies. But of course, the, the human body is very complex and we don't know the complete story until we, we test, we assess T cell uh, immunity, for example. But things, things, Look worrying that definitely from from the early studies in which uh, Sira from from these people have been tested against uh, this variant. Thank you very much. I mean, it's a it's a fascinating area of science, and it's not one that I'm uh, got much technical expertise in at all. So uh, thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thanks. And uh, another question. So it's following up with Louis' questions. questions. So if there are there any are, more variants, would it be distinguished? For example, are they different enough? So is there any way we can identify um, any animal variants? 
Yes, uh, animal uh, uh, variants, I believe they have uh, unique mutations uh, like those that were isolated in minks. Uh, I'm, I, mean, I don't have this in, 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 in my head now, but uh, definitely uh, the, the advantage of the method we use is that um, once you know the mutations you want to detect, you can very easily design your PCRs and even go back to old samples and, and test uh, whether those variants were there or not. Uh, a very important point is uh, what has been mentioned about sensitivity. And sensitivity, of course, is limited because uh, of the, the, the technique we use, but uh, hopefully with the use of, of nanopore, we could increase that because maybe by just sequencing thousands of, of molecules, we, we can increase the sensitivity for detection of these variants. Yeah. So, um, so this is just, uh, I recall another question. In terms of a sequ using a sequencing technology, uh, obviously this is really a standard, good standard methodology to identify this uh, new variant and mutants. And then yeah. uh, in terms of this uh, quantification, for example, we talking if we're talking about the Omicron, they have over 30 mutants. Uh, yes. So uh, when it's, it could more to go further for technical sequencing procedures, so when you look at those new mutants, are you going to do a full spectrum of the sequencing or you probably just look at uh, some of them or one of them to confirm yeah. the results? The, 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 the target, the PCR targets we have, well, for which we have the test, we have the primers, so we can do we, we can do it today. We are doing it as we speak. Uh, those actually cover a lot of mutations, so I think one of the fragments cover 11 mutations and the other seven or something like that. So it's more than enough because we will actually what you do is you estimate the percentage of that mutation and uh, at each position. So you come up with a very similar number is, you know, 100 almost I would say 100 percent sure that variant is there because in fact it was already quite uh, I was already quite confident with previous variants uh, having only three or four changes. So now you can imagine with all these ones, definitely you will see, you know, 10 mutations at a very similar proportion in a, in a particular sample. That means that proportion is very accurate. Okay, okay. All right. I think it was really powerful. I think in terms of you, when you identify, identify a new and mutants, especially probably you haven't yet know there is already mutant coming up in the over the transmission process. So um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Because we're targeting the, the, the regions in which we know the virus is mutated more and where uh, more meaningful mutations occur. Uh, yes, you could detect mutations that have not been identified before. Although, you know, as I say, the UK is so quick <laughs> finding <laughs> yeah. potential variants that, yeah, we yeah. probably always lag behind. Yeah, so it's always, now we, I think the, 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 the real challenge is in terms of, of the logistic uh, and uh, a, a surface cutting a lab uh, to allow for this sequencing, because, you know, obviously we can't, and uh, do this daily or, you know, for all the samples. So that's going to uh, raise lots of, need a lot of resource and uh, labor to carry out this experiment. But well, the, yeah, yeah. The, the thing is, uh, uh, for example, if you, uh, Beckton covers 4 million people. So by testing a sample every three, four days, you're testing millions of people at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So th that's the big advantage. And so if there was a lab with the sufficient resources dedicated to this, I think that would be very informative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I maybe agree. not that expensive. Yeah, yeah. Do, so. do you know the um, the resolution, like how many people would have to have the virus to, to show up in the sewage? Um, yeah, I, that's an excellent question. <laughs> I would love to, to work quite with widespread or, or could you pick it up from just a few people? Um... Yeah, I mean, that's that's the sensitivity question. So at the moment we are only at about 0.5%. So when the virus is at, at that proportion, 
I think we can we can detect it. Okay. So it's, it's, st it's still not very high, but it could be improved by sequencing more replicates or maybe with this nanopore technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Also uh, one comment from Sonia. From Sonia, he said it's. Um, she said it's. Uh, it's might lag behind in identifying new variant in the UK. So obviously, it's Omicron is coming up so quickly in the transmission in the population. But globally, it's maybe a really uh, effective way, especially we raise, we be all that the new variant or new mutants coming up. So that could be very, very exciting. We always keep monitoring as, as you know, maybe just three or four days, get to the yeah. million or billion population monitored and understand. So we are yeah. feel confident. Yeah. And, and, and it can tell you, it probably can tell you a lot about transmission dynamics. So in terms of research studies, this, this could be very useful because, you know, you can look globally at how the different variants uh, transfer from from different places. And th this also has the advantage of actually the results precede those from clinical samples, because of course people have to be infected and then notice they are infected, going booking a test, having the test and having the test result. So that's maybe a week or 10 days before you you have the clinical result, the, the, that virus is already in, in the sewage. So, you know, we take, we can do this in three, four days. So still, it might still be useful as an alert system if done quickly. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking in particular, if now all the attention goes to this uh, SARS-CoV-2, if from the bioinformatically, we understand which region is easier to be mutant or get a new variant. So yes, then exactly, yes. Yeah, that's make your uh, make the work easier to get more. It's not the uh, the so specific, but it still can narrow down a little bit of the region for this sequencing. So rather than to do a full spectrum, uh, yeah. And you can target uh, like you know quarantine hotels or areas where you think there would be a higher proportion of, of variants as, as you do with clinical surveillance. Yeah, so that's a good uh, testing point, I think. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, here come up other questions. Uh, is your any testing done at the transport hubs, for example, testing airport, sewage, ferry terminals? So this is exactly what, what we just <laughs> mentioned that that could be a very useful thing to do. Yeah, so actually going to this question, I think there is already work some, some work have done from Australia recently. Um, earlier, I think dating, to back, dating back to last year, they have carried out a study to in an airport. Uh, they analyze this wastewater from the airport. Uh, actually, it's been also reported in some public media. I got some um, comments for them. And uh, recently, after the identification of Omicron, Australian researchers also recently disclosed that they have done some work on Omicron uh, in the airport. So that's going to be a very, very interesting. We are looking forward to see these results. So, and also, this is an interesting place to testing, you know. Yes, they found one, I think, in, in, in New Zealand, in the in one of these confinement hotels, yeah? Yeah. Yes. Okay, another question is, is the nested PCR protocol you use already published? Yes, yes, several publications already. And, and, and the good thing about this is that we, we use the same for poliovirus, the D68, so we are actually able to very quickly design such a, an assay for any virus. Yeah. Okay, maybe uh, you can check over the literature from Javier. Uh, anyone who wants to contact me, I will send you any information you need. Yeah. Okay. So, or uh, if any people have follow-up questions, and also we are very happy to pass over to Javier if you don't know Javier's contacts. All right. Um, thanks again. Um, Javier for this um, fantastic talk uh, seminar and I think it's also our last one in 2021 so we will have some more from the new year 
So just uh, uh, keep uh, your eyes on our website and also we will circulate within our uh, working group member and also within the public medias.